Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my driveway. Today we're going to be talking about the saw itself because as I am recording this, it was seven years ago that I started on the build of this thing. And if you haven't seen the series of videos I made about them, or it's been a while, this would be a nice little quick refresher because we're going to put all that into one video. So a little background before getting into the actual build of the saw. I got into chainsaw milling over a decade ago, which was a really easy and convenient way for me to be able to cut wood in my own backyard. I didn't need the space for a whole sawmill and I could cut some pretty big and wide stuff. At the same time, I got into urban logging, being able to go out and pick up logs and trees that were being removed from people's properties. And it felt like the logs kept getting bigger and bigger until one day I came across a stack of logs which had been removed for a street widening project in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. And I started hauling those things home on my log trailer. Every week I'd stop by and grab another log. And these were just posted on Craigslist for firewood. And what likely happened with these is because they're so big, uh, no one ever came to try and attempt to cut them into firewood to get them out of there. So every week I go back and I was surprised and a little bit happy that the pile was still exactly the way that I left it. I ended up pulling five logs out of this pile and the only reason I stopped was because the logs got too big for me to be able to load onto my trailer and then actually transport. So I had all these logs sitting in my driveway and I was starting to put together a bigger chainsaw mill to actually be able to cut these because they were too big for the existing chainsaw mill that I had. So once I had the bigger bar and a bigger saw to run it, I decided to not do that and go ahead and try and design and build a giant bandsaw mill in my backyard. So in this first part, we're gonna cover the construction of the bed, which is what the logs sit on and also supports the carriage. So I had the steel yard cut all of my pieces to length for me. This was a lot easier than trying to cut all the stuff myself, especially with this heavier gauge steel that I was using. For instance, these cross members are 70 pounds a piece. So I got started by prepping all of the frame pieces. These are gonna be out of two by six by quarter inch wall thick tube and that's going to be the essentially foundation for the rest of the build. I had several holes to drill and tap into the cross members for the runners, which will sit on top of them. I also drilled some holes on the underside for the leveling feet. One of the reasons I went with a heavier gauge tube was to make sure that I could make a frame that was going to be flat and stay flat. It wouldn't warp under its own weight, allowing me to make the bed really easy to level. I used a string line to bring the whole thing into flat and then I can lay in all the cross members at their spacing and then go about the welding process. I also didn't want the welding to distort the frame at all, so I took every precaution I could to make sure that didn't happen. I added some pieces of angle iron on top to help add some rigidity, and then I darted around back and forth in order to distribute the welding stress as it went along welding all those seams. Now I can add the track for the carriage. This is some two by two by three inch thick angle iron and that gets bolted to that frame. And then for the cross members, these are stainless steel. A lot of manufacturers just wrap a piece of tube with some stainless steel sheet metal. I went with a full stainless runner for, you know, bonus points. <laughs> I drilled an access hole in the top and then a through hole in the bottom that would match up with the tapped hole in the cross member beneath. And that's about it for the bed. This is the foundation for the entirety of the rest of the build. So I'll kick things off by making the fenders for the rollers, which will protect them and also support the shaft on the opposite side of the uprights. The uprights are prepped next by drilling the holes for the roller shafts. The material for one of the carriage sides is laid out and welded together. James Wright came to help me for a few days and it was nice to have an extra set of hands for erecting this carriage. Once one side is welded, it can be used as a template for the second side. And now we'll go about standing the two sides up and connecting them with the cross members. We put some temporary bracing to hold the uprights in place while getting everything installed. Last of the four braces are installed. The temporary stuff can be pulled off and the carriage can be rolled down the track. There were a few extremely joyous moments throughout this build and this was definitely one of them. I made something that rolls on something else. <laughs> Next I'll knock out some of the prep work for the saw head. I'm installing a third upright which will support these linear rails. The bearings are right on this rail will guide the saw head through its vertical travel. I cut the rail to length and use it as a template to drill and tap the mounting holes. I'll get these stood up on the carriage and into rough position and clamp them in place with some bracing. That 12 foot long tube there will become the beam for the saw head and I'll use it to help align these rails. I'll make the mounting plates for the bearings next 
Nothing super crazy here, just four tapped holes into a piece of plate. I'll slide the bearings onto the rails and weld the plates to the beam. A quick break to play with my son, and as they say, it goes way too fast. I set a chain hoist up so I could run the beam through his travel, tweaking the uprights until they were parallel. Once I had the motion feeling pretty smooth, I'll tack the uprights and move the beam again to make sure nothing moved. I'll gradually weld the uprights and move the beam until they're fully welded. That's going to do it for the carriage, and this time we're adding the wheels starting with the idle wheel. This wheel needs to be able to move in and out to tension the blade, so I'm creating a box that will slide over the saw beam. The beam is wrapped with a few index cards to create a bit of clearance, and then the beam is wrapped with half-inch plate. My friend April was in town, and she helped me with this part of the wheel mount. Now this is the pre-made wheel shaft that I'll be using, so next I'll add a second plate to mount the shaft to, which will also give me room to add alignment adjustment screws. That plate is welded to the box, and then the four bolt holes are drilled and tapped. To make the adjusters, I tapped holes in half-inch bar stock and then cut them to length and added some shaping. A pair of these are added to each side to allow the shaft to be rotated left to right. I'll also add an adjuster to the back to set the in and out position. On the prefabricated shaft plate, I tapped holes for jack screws, which will allow for the wheel to tilt. The whole assembly slides onto the beam and then the wheel can be mounted to the shaft. Seeing this wheel up there spinning was another one of those joyous moments. Now we can hop over to the other side and add the drive wheel. This is the shaft that I had machined for the saw, and it gets mounted in these pillow block bearings. I originally planned for three, but there is plenty of support with just two, which makes the mounting easier. The bearings get bolted to a three-quarter inch thick plate with three-quarter inch bolts. Back to the saw beam, I'll cut and add an additional section of tube to support the mounting plate. I'll clamp the assembly to the beam to get it aligned and to test it out before welding the plate to the beam. Lastly, I'll add tabs for bolts, which will allow for tracking adjustment on this wheel as well. And that takes care of the band wheels. With these 30 inch wheels on there, it's really starting to look like a saw. This is the motor I'm gonna to use to power the saw. It's a 10 horsepower three phase motor off an industrial buffer. I'll power it with the VFD, which will handle the phase conversion and allow for a few bonuses like slow start, braking, and variable speed. This is my first experience working with VFDs, so I mocked everything up in the shop to make sure it would work before taking it outside. Back on the saw, I next needed some way to mount the motor to the saw. I created a platform above the beam to keep the belts out of the way of the sawing area. On top of the platform, I attach a motor mount which slides the motor back and forth to tension the belts. The chain hoist came in handy again to lift the motor up onto the platform. With the motor in position, I could measure for and calculate the belt length that I needed, and that takes care of the motor and transmission. Let's add the blade guides next. The blade guides will move across the saw and be supported by the same type of linear bearings as the saw head. Similarly, I'll drill and tap the mounting holes for the rail on the underside of the saw beam. I'll make a couple more mounting plates for the bearings out of half inch plate. This is the pre-made blade guide assembly and I'll use a blade on the wheel so I can mock things up. I need to cut a post which will drop down from the bearing and connect to the blade guide. Once I have things figured out, I can weld the post to the blade guide assembly and the mounting plate. With that bearing, the guide moves smoothly with no play. Next, I'll add the adjustment post which will allow for the blade guides to be moved from outside the cutting area and hold it in place right where I want it. This is the telescopic tube type setup. I drilled and tapped for some locking bolts in the bigger tube and welded a post to it. I'll clamp the post to the saw head and get everything aligned and then weld the assembly to the saw head and to the guide. I repeated the same thing on the other side so I have adjustable guides on both sides of the saw. Now jumping forward a bit, one small mistake I had made was with the position and length of the post. It wasn't quite correct and was outside the range of the guide's adjustment. I could have cut the post off or replaced it, but I just cut it and added this piece of half inch stock which move the blade guides down and back by the required amount. At the base of the carriage, I added a couple pieces of scrap tube to create a platform, which will be the base of the lifting column. Down here, I'll mount a thrust bearing, which will support the weight of the saw head. I made a bearing holder from a piece of round tube and a plate. Now jumping over to the beam, I'll drill a hole through it on both sides for the rod to pass through. The undersides of these holes are where I mount the nut for the screw. I made a nut holder out of some scrap pieces of plate and that gets bolted in place. To start on the lifting column, I made a step shaft for the bearing by welding a piece of shaft stock inside a piece of tube. That sits on top of the bearing and this cover I made slides down to keep it clean. Next I'll feed the acne rod through the saw beam and start threading on the nut. The rod meets up with the step shaft below with a coupler. On top of the acne rod I added another coupler, drawing it to a piece of shaft stock where I'll mount the upper bearing. I made a bearing mount which will offset the bearing the right distance from the carriage and next is the motor for the lift. It's another three-phase motor that will run off a of VFD and it also has a gearbox. 
I'll make a mounting plate for it with a slide mechanism to tension the chain. The mount is bolted to the side of the carriage and then the motor can be bolted to the mount. I ran some chain between the screws and ran the motor to test the setup. And this was another one of those joyous moments. I had made something that goes up and down. <laughs> Next up is the proper chain linkage though. The chain will follow along the front so the motor can be lifted past the top of the carriage. I have four idler sprockets to install. These first two are going to be on mounts with one adjustable for tensioning. These get bolted to the upper corners of the carriage and the movable one also gets a piece of angle nearby for the tensioning screw. The two other sprockets get attached to the underside of the carriage with tapped holes and bolts. With all those sprockets installed, I can start adding the roller chain, snaking it through all those sprockets. I cut the chain, made the final connection, and gave the tensioner a try. Another thing that worked. Lastly, I can connect the motor to the driven sprocket and tension its chain by moving the motor on its mounting plate. I can flip it on and watch the chain travel around the sprockets. It's kind of mesmerizing. With that lift mechanism installed, the saw head can be moved to set the cut height. Here you can see how the motor is able to pass the top of the carriage when the saw is at its max cutting height. <laughs> the tensioning mechanism is based off of this 10 ton porta power type ram. The first thing I need is something for the ram to push against on the beam and the idle wheel mount. I'm using a scrap piece of heavy gauge angle for this, which I'll bolt on. I'm using eight half inch bolts purely for aesthetics because I think it just looks way cool. <laughs> <laughs> on the beam, I'm adding an extra piece of plate to bulk up the area where the angle will bolt on. I drilled the bolt holes with this plate tacked on so I could later use it as a template on the beam. Those eight holes get tapped and then I can repeat a similar process on the idle mount, drilling and tapping the holes to mount that piece of angle. Next, I need a way to mount the ram. I use a piece of tube to create a holder for the base and I'll make a mount for the other end of a piece of scrap rectangular tube. I'll do the final install, bolting the holder to the beam and welding the ring to the angle on the beam. I also add some gussets to the angle for some bonus points. I always forget how cold it was when I was building this thing. <laughs> so that's how the blade tensioner came together. Now when I operate the pump, the ram will push the idle wheel out along the beam. I use a blade tension meter to figure out the proper tension for the blade, and that works out to be around 2,500 pounds of force to tension an inch and a half blade. Next up are the blade guards. I made these out of 10 gauge steel as I wanted them to be difficult to damage. I'm pretty rough with things. My coffee. The guards are made in three sections. The drive wheel and idle wheel are pretty much the same with the drive wheel having a dust chute and the idle wheel having a little bit of an oblong shape to allow the wheel inside to move as the blade is being tensioned. The middle transverse area is pretty simply a box. The wheel guards get a bump out in the back to make room for the wheel mounts and I'll form the perimeter with some strips. Next I'll make the doors, which are just a little bit bigger than the backing plates. Those get wrapped in a narrow strip, which will overlay the main body of the guards. I'll add a hinge to the transverse guard and box in the clearance areas in the wheel guards. Later on I painted them and added some latches to hold the doors closed. And that takes care of the work on the saw head. Next time we'll finish up the build by adding the log clamps. So I'll start off by adding the side stops. This is a telescopic tube type setup again. The outer tube is two and a half inch square tube. And I need to add three tapped holes to this. In the back, I'll tap two half inch holes for bolts. These bolts will allow me to adjust the upright, which will be clamped in here, bringing them into square to the bed and all in the same line. Another hole will be tapped and drilled into the front edge. This will be for the locking bolt, which will push the upright into the corner and hold it in position. Those outside tube things get welded to the bed. I use a scrap piece of two by four to space them all the same distance from the side of the bed. The vertical posts are just two inch square tube. I put a angle cut on one end. That's gonna allow for logs to roll easily and not get hung up on any corners. Next up are the clamps. I wanted these to be pretty quick and simple and cheap. So I made them out of just some gas pipe and fittings. For whatever reason, I decided to make my own flanges because they're overpriced <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so I welded some plate to some pipe and then had a coupler to make a simple flange. A piece of pipe gets joined between the two flanges and those flanges get bolted to the bed. I slide a T-fitting over the pipe in the middle and that allows me to attach the actual clamp upright. The nice thing about this is it's kind of modular so if you need longer clamps or shorter clamps you can adjust the size of the pipe here in the middle. On top of the actual clamping dogs I made these like screw and spike things which worked out okay but I never really ended up using them the way I originally intended them. I ended up just using these things with a hammer. You can just hammer the spike into the log and then hammer along the bottom to set the clamp along that lower pipe. And in actuality, 
because I don't really saw a whole lot of small stuff, I don't ever use the clamps anyway. So with the log clamps installed, that really is about it for the construction of the saw. I could get it calibrated and dialed in and turn this thing on and make a few test cuts. And I have to say, this is probably one of the happiest days of my life after spending months of building this thing, not really knowing exactly how this is gonna work, not really following an already established plan. Having this thing actually turn on and cut nice and straight and flat and like flawlessly was just an amazing feeling. We got boards. <laughs> After I finished up the build and I had it running, a lot of people were interested in the plans for this. So I did develop a full set of plans for the saw. So if you wanna build your own giant bandsaw mill in your driveway, in your backyard, your front yard, your shop, in your barn, you can build it wherever you want. I do have this full set of plans available on my website. That's at mattcremona.com. And it's always fun for me when someone builds one of these things and shows it to me and they're so excited. I'm so excited for them. It's a very rewarding and very it's an amazing tool to have. So that's the abbreviated build of the saw. This thing has been operational now for six and a half years. And every time I get something on here that's like big and huge and the saw cuts, it's absolutely perfect and a wonderful experience. I am just, uh, just happy all over on the inside. <laughs> One question I've gotten quite a lot over the years is would I have done anything differently or do I have any regrets of anything that I did do? The answer to that for all practical purposes is no. There really isn't anything on here where I'm like, I could have done this differently, I could have done this better. Because as I was thinking about this, doing the research, doing the designing, doing the build, the overarching theme in my mind was to not make compromises so that I would end up having regrets in the future. I feel like as soon as you start compromising on some things, some design aspect, for whatever reason, you end up regretting it you know, in the future. That was one of the biggest recurring themes in the research that I was doing on people that made their own saws. It felt like more often than not, someone would build a saw and then they get it running and then they're like, I'm gonna take it apart and make this thing stronger, do this thing a little better. Um, and I didn't really want a tinkering project. I wanted something that it was just here, it was ready to cut and it cut perfectly every time, you know, no BS, just always, always working flawlessly. And really the only minor thing I might have done differently was make it just a little bit bigger. I designed this saw to be able to cut a six foot diameter log and have a little bit of uh, comfort factor. I gave it four inches of comfort above that six feet and I don't think that's necessarily quite enough. You probably need like a foot over the intended cut capacity because once you get a log that big on the saw, getting it positioned like two inches one way or another is kind of tedious and kind of annoying and doesn't always work out that well. And a six foot diameter log, if you want to like contain the entire shape of the log, it might, you might need a little more width to like follow a curve or something. But in reality, that hasn't been too much of an issue. If I do have something that's too big on here, maybe a small trimming cut is all I really need to be able to complete that cut. And it's not really that big of a deal. So let me know if you have any questions on the saw or anything else back in the shop or whatever. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking. It all starts here. You gotta saw the wood before you can work it. <laughs>